Hello, I'm Fauzi Malouf Filho, Associate Editor for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and today I have the great pleasure to interview Dr. John DeWitt from the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology of Indiana University Medical Center, who has recently published his research entitled Endoscopic Suturing of Esophageal Fully Covered Self-Expanding Metal Stents Reduces Rates of Stent Migration. John, thank you for coming. Thank you. Could you summarize the main findings of your research, John? I'd be happy to. Uh, we uh, have been placing uh, esophageal stents for benign disease at our institution for about 10 years. And the, the these types of stents that we've placed over those 10 years has, has really changed. Uh, we used to use uh, sutured, uh, excuse me, uh, fully covered stents that were unsutured. Uh, we've also used partially covered stents uh, and, and recently we've changed to using um, fully covered stents that were sutured. And over the last 10 years, we've placed uh, about 180 stents in about 100 patients. And we found with our research that the rates of migration of those stents were lower when we sutured our fully covered stents uh, compared to the fully covered stents that were unsutured. Uh, and interestingly, the rates between um, fully covered, unsutured, and fully covered, uh, sorry, and partially covered uh, were, were really no different. So our research really also identified that um, there were risk factors for migration, uh, particularly in addition to the type of stent. We found that esophageal surgery was protective uh, to prevent migration, but patients who had a history of migration of those stents uh, were more likely to have them. So uh, we, we concluded from our research that suturing of fully covered stents for benign uh, indications uh, appears to lower migration rates. Thank you, John. And I believe that the GIE audience is very interested in learning some technical tips and advice on stent suturing. Could you detail the suturing technique of esophageal sure. stents? So the, the suturing is used, uh, the, the, the device we use the, is the Apollo overstitch, uh, which requires a 2T endoscope. And through the two channels, uh, an anchor exchange and a needle driver is placed. Um, and be, using the suture attached to the needle driver, um, we placed uh, a suture into the diamond covered uh, or the diamond part of the stent and then uh, after making uh, one suture uh, around the diamond uh, or the, uh, the string of the uh, suture, another uh, suture is made about two centimeters proximal to that and then that is cinched with a device and then that's repeated two or three times in order to secure the, uh, the stent into place. And how long does it take to place two or three sutures? You know, in, in our learning curve, honestly, it, it took uh, probably about 20 to 25 minutes for the first uh, several patients that we did. And once the learning uh, occurred, probably after maybe five to 10 cases, we were able to get that down from um, start to finish in about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so it, it really added uh, minimal time to the procedure at the end. That's great. And in your results, even sutured fully covered stents had a 9% migration rate. Do you recommend any specific strategy to e reduce further this rate? That's a good, great, great question. Uh, you know, it's, it's the lowest migration rate that's been reported for suturing of uh, fully covered stents. So it may be about as low as we can get. I don't know if that number can get even further. Uh, in order to achieve uh, the 9% migration rate, we really added um, uh, one of the techniques that we added to try to lower that was to try to get that first suture into the diamond uh, interstices of the stent. Uh, I feel that if, if the first suture is done into the string, it adds only perhaps minimal uh, traction to that stent. So I find that, I, I feel like that maybe that added a little bit to the data that we had to, to try to lower that migration rate by getting that first suture into the stent itself uh, rather than just a string. And we are aware that the suturing device is capable of producing full thickness sutures in the GI tract. Considering that the esophagus has a thin wall, how concerned should we be in damaging large vessels such as the aorta and even the respiratory tree? Yeah, uh, that, that actually was a concern of ours when we first started suturing. Um, um, sometimes uh, in the stomach, obviously, we're not as concerned about uh, taking full thickness resections or full thickness bites. Um, despite those concerns, uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a report of um, accidentally suturing any vital structures such as a blood vessel, um, the trachea, um, or the heart. 
So uh, while that remains a concern, um, you know, we have not seen that to date uh, occur with this device, to my knowledge. And, and there is an accessory called the helix to mm -hmm. grasp tissue. Do you use this uh, accessory to do the suture? I, I use it occasionally uh, for the first bite into the stent. Uh, it really is not possible to get the helix into the uh, interstices of the stent in order to achieve that first bite. However, for that second bite, um, which is used to uh, about two centimeters proximal to the stent, um, sometimes it is very helpful to use that helix because the esophagus is relatively parallel to the device and often it's, it's hard to get that curved arm into the esophageal wall to get a full thickness bite. So occasionally when it is difficult, uh, yes, I will use the helix to help me get that second bite. That's great. And when the suture stands were removed, how difficult was to cut the sutures and to detach the stands from the esophageal wall? Yeah, um, so the, uh, you know, it's interesting, despite the low migration rate, uh, the sutures often are not intact when the patient comes back to have that stent removed about six to eight weeks later. Uh, occasionally when it is, um, it's still intact, we do use endoscopic scissors for the, uh, for the removal of those um, sutures, but often just traction with um, uh, rat tooth forceps is enough to dislodge the remaining intact stents um, to, to have them removed. So. And did the model or the diameter of the stent have any influence on the migration rate? Yeah, we, we actually didn't find that that was the case. We uh, did control for the stent length, uh, stent diameter, uh, and even the manufacturer, uh, and didn't find that that really affected the results that we had with this procedure. So uh, the only factors that we actually did find that were predictive uh, of migration were a history of migration uh, and whether or not the stent was sutured. Uh, suturing the stent did prevent migration, um, but uh, interestingly, um, we found that if a patient had had previous esophageal surgery, that was actually protective for migration, uh, which, is, which is, was an interesting finding we were not expecting to find. And based on our results, would you suture stents just in selected cases or whenever you insert a fully covered metal esophageal stent? So I, I believe if a patient has a history of migration uh, before, uh, those patients should all be sutured in now if that uh, is available at your institution. For uh, patients who may have a stricture, we found on univariate analysis that that did predict uh, migration. In other words, if a patient had the, the stent placed for, uh, for a stricture, those patients were more likely to have migration. On multivariate analysis, it didn't hold up, but perhaps patients who would have a stricture uh, should have that sutured. Me personally, I still suture all my patients with benign disease because I feel like the, the benefit to the patient to have a stent which is less likely to migrate will uh, maybe save that patient a procedure uh, if that needs to be replaced in case it does migrate. And now we have data suggesting, at least in abstract form, that there may be a more cost-effective approach uh, to suture the stent in place rather than having to have the patient maybe have a 30 to 40% chance of having to have that stent replaced in case it migrates. Thank you very much, John. You're welcome.